Good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world, and a very warm welcome to this Explain Pain in the Clinic. My name is Joanna and I am Director of NOI in Europe and I am joined this morning by my very good friend and Principal NOI teacher, Tim Beams. Tim has been a NOI teacher for well over 15 years. He has taught literally hundreds of explained pain courses to thousands of clinicians all over the world. He is an active clinician himself for specializing in complex and persistent pain. He is also founder of an organization called La Pub Scientifique, which is an online platform for clinicians to learn about the very latest developments in clinical practice and pain research directly from the researchers and clinical specialists themselves. They also have a really cool podcast. Uh, Tim, oh, you've already done it. <laughs> Tim has dropped the link to uh, the website in the chat. So do go and check out the podcast. There's a new episode coming out today, I believe. Uh, Tim is also co-author of the Graded Motor Imagery Handbook with David Butler and Laura Mosley. So uh, just to give you a little sense of what we're going to do today, these sessions are all about giving you a taste of explained pain and how to practically apply it in the clinic. Now, some of you will have done an explained pain course already. And for those of you, these sessions are designed to reinforce, reinforce what you've already learned and uh, support it. But if you are new to explain pain, it'll give you a taste of what we cover in the core course. So uh, Tim will be talking for about 20 minutes. If you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A or the chat and we'll get to as many of them as we can. And if you want to record, watch the recording of this session, you can access it on our YouTube channel, which I will just drop the link for the chat in. I'll drop the link in the chat in a moment. So today, Tim, we are talking about navigating nerve injuries. I have to say, this has been a really popular session. We've had lots of people sign up to uh, join live and get the recording. So let's get started. <laughs> what are you going to What are you going to cover today, Tim? Um, I mean, probably not as much as we want. Again, uh, <laughs> uh, well, let's like let's quickly set out a scene about nerve injuries, and and before that, why um, I picked this as a topic because I yeah. felt like it was very relevant. Um, and then um, I was just giving you a potted um, summary of like current research, wasn't I? And saying it's a really exciting area, actually. So. Um, what I thought I'd do is is just walk us through a little bit of that and um, what relevance that is for us as clinicians, like given what we're finding here, you know, how does that um, how does that affect the the way that we work with people and the decisions and, and the suggestions and what have you that we that we come up with? Um, yeah, so the plausibility right. behind the, the clinical decisions. So fantastic. Yeah. So um nerve nerve injuries what what is a nerve injury <laughs> yeah, um, so I, like first of all and it's not normal like we don't normally share our own personal experiences do we regularly but so this is an area that was is very personal for me because i had a nerve injury um when i was younger and lost the feeling uh, in my arm and, and hand and the ability to be able to move my um, arm as well. So um, I remember having some horrendous nights uh, in pain, mm. <laughs> struggling to know where to put myself and uh, dress, you know, struggling to dress myself uh, and things like that. So, um, yeah, so so this is very personal relevance and, and perhaps, you know, just me telling you a little bit about what I was experiencing. You know, these are the sorts of um, characteristics and features that might be um, fairly typical for someone who's had a, a nerve injury, although a nerve injury encompasses huge variation. Um, and one um, classification that we have is major and minor nerve injuries and, and uh, major nerve injuries where there's evidence that the nerve itself has been uh, cut or the um, coating of the nerve has been cut, so the connective tissues. Um, and, and, and 
they can have quite um, mega effects on that person's ability to be able to to function and move and yeah. and and sense the world as well. Um, and then minor sounds um, like um, the minor is a horrible word actually for for the other ends of uh, nerve injury, which are the ones where you haven't lost that co um, that uh, connectivity in in terms of the nerve being severed. Um, but people suffering with things like uh, some of the neuropathies, carpal tunnel syndrome, radiculopathy. Diabetic neuropathy can ha can be can have you know incredible amounts of uh, pain and and be limited uh, as well. So yeah, minor doesn't in any way infer how it affects someone. It's just that categorization. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so that's that. And 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 I the reason that I picked this as a topic not because I wanted to tell everybody about my experience um although that has relevance in when uh, what I've explored and why I've been interested in pain and and things like that but um because it is unfortunately a comment that I hear people tell me back but uh, I I had a patient um a couple of weeks ago who basically said I've I've saw my surgeon and they've told me that this is this is what to expect you know this is as much as I'm going to get back and um, and the, from a recovery point of view and I just like that is so finite when you hear that isn't it um, so and, and I just I just want to test the waters <laughs> like let's see whether we can shake that a bit because um i don't think that's a great message uh, do you think that's something that may be more commonly um said about nerve injuries than other types of injuries with people I then i think i think i think it can be yeah um i'm i don't know because i i i'm not mm. working constantly with nerve injuries so i don't know exactly but but it's certainly a message that you hear regularly, isn't it, Joe? Um, you know, yeah. oh, well, it's been going oh, on two yeah. years. So, yeah, this is your lot. You know, you're done. <laughs> Nothing more that we can do. Um, and to me, that's just the, the person, the treating clinician, whoever that might be, is just limited in their thinking. Mm. Um, and I find that really depressing. <laughs> I mean, how sad is that? Of course there's stuff. You can always do something. Like, what on earth are you talking about? So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You tell them, Jim. <laughs> so yeah, well, I'm sorry. I just um yeah. But and and I and I and sorry, it's coming back to me now, the conversation I had because because the thing that I told them, uh, I, I, or the, how I answered that wasn't, oh God, that's awful, you know, this is complete rubbish. It was, how did that make you feel? Mm. And and he was like, well, it feels like, you know, that's there's nothing more that can be done. And, and I don't, yeah, and I thought I'd be, a, I was young, I've, I wanted to be able to do more with my life and get so-and-so back and what have you. So, yeah, quite a um, depressing. <laughs> there is something yeah. in that messaging we have talked about before, because being <clears throat> being able to be um, present in the moment of where you're at, uh, we often call it acceptance, don't we? So being mm. able to make um, sense of where you're at at this time in point, not you sort of reach back and oh, I wish I was doing what I could do before or reaching forward, um, I think is important here from a trajectory you know from a from a recovery traje trajectory <laughs> there is a something interesting about nerve injuries is that the the time things take to change and resolve are significantly different from injuries that you more typically might have experienced like um you know cutting yourself so injuring your skin or tearing a muscle or straining a ligament or whatever so there there is significant differences in the time involved in healing um and and, and that i feel like that's even an important message for people to get now is that a barrier for clinicians do, do, or barrier do, are clinicians aware of that and um is it do they get more nervous uh, with nerve, in, nerve injury 
it's it's it, it, it's not a barrier but the systems in place are, are not always set up for long-term conditions or long-term rehabilitation mm -hmm. it's not that no one is because there are some fantastic places out there with wonderful knowledge but you know as a whole yeah people aren't set up for, for a longer term recovery or a longer term rehabilitation and even the person who's going through that recovery phase th there there needs to be that sort of mental adjustment to say and i can think of someone really really clearly here where after about 18 months they said to me you know tim that first day we met you i was in tears because i asked you how long things were going to take and you um, i now know that you were really honest with me and you said we're likely to work we need to work and set our sights on the next two years of working together and they mm. said that and that was what i needed because everybody before was saying it's going to take four or six weeks and, and you know, you're going to get there. And then I was doing it for four or six weeks and there wasn't yeah. the change I was expecting. So actually that trajectory in time is an important one and yeah. the readjustment of expectations. Um, Interesting. Which, which fits what we're going to talk about because, because y y your body takes as long as your body takes to to go through you know a good healing process mm. and uh, a part of the messaging that we want to give today is about creating the the right condition for that healing to take place as well yeah. um so, so moving on from the depression the depressing <laughs> statements <laughs> and, and that brings us because it is you know how awful but that brings us then into the sort of the, the what can we do about it phase yeah. of yeah. Uh, what we're going to talk about today and the uh how we can harness the body's capacity for change yeah yeah exactly and 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 i pro look, then probably look there's another area that we really need to just touch on which is that that differential diagnosis the sort of quantification and understanding of what might be going on in someone is definitely possible with nerve injury so someone who has the skills to be able to perform a a good bedside neurological examination is really important so you've got a knowledge and understanding of whether there is loss of conductivity where there is an absence of mm. or, or reduction in sensibility in their awareness of things like uh, light touch pin prick vibration thermal changes um, whether or not they can um, engage their um, muscles um, whether or not they fatigue easily and what that might look like and you know for some people testing uh, reflexes although for me the, the, you know it's so that's that's not as it's not giving us as clear um, guidance as, as perhaps we might think it does so, mm. um, so yeah there's some sort of simple stuff to do without even getting funky without getting to the to the you need to train to be able to do some sort of two point discrimination or um, some matter perceptual um, testing where you're localizing or you're trying to get an understanding of what you're being touched by and where you're touched and, and that just yeah. takes a little bit more finessing but but those might be elements of what you provide in rehabilitation is that sort of targeted finesse where you're re-educating that person to be aware of what touch might be like or what movement might be like for them. So if somebody wasn't confident in, in those skills, where, where would they best find out about those? I mean, they could come on a NOI course, <laughs> uh, but, but, but we often don't have enough time to go through things like that. Um, uh, are we talking which course are we talking you, you about the, you put me on the spot there haven't you sorry I, I haven't got a good answer for you because I, I actually don't know where they would um go and train is that. it a monus course is it a mobilization course you, would you cover that in you that? would learn a little bit of that but not yeah not that detail um yeah okay maybe there's a gap there in that the... would be a starting point though wouldn't it i think the monus uh, yeah 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 but but yeah I, I i don't know um spend a day with me in a clinic and we could do it david bolton on the call you know he would be able to train people yeah. <laughs> um a, a mentor someone who's got wonderful skills yeah and then you yeah. 
practice and rehearse and, and that's what you have to do um yeah <laughs> um, doing course tim marie says okay right uh, um moving on we need to we need to get to the yeah uh, well what I was, do we do about you know, it bit? i was gonna do because because um uh, i have this in mind that explain pain as a book is in its 21st year uh which is amazing but but dave wrote a book a few years before that called the sensitive nervous system and one of the things that he preempted when there wasn't actually the knowledge out there was he had this diagram of an elbow and a nerve and then all the different um inf possible influences that might change in nerve injury and he included things like um um autonomic nervous system changes so stress regulation and how that might affect the nerve so we know that someone who can be stressed their nerve can uh, be in a edgier state but yeah. when you are in an injury um when you're going through uh, healing and your nerve is already sensitized you lay down more adreno receptors and you become more sensitive to the normal circulating um adrenaline for instance so he oh. was preempting some phenomenal like and but, but now we know that that might be a, a part of a diagnostic workup to understand whether or not stress and stressors affect how someone feels and and given that that uh, and that was 25 years ago but given that now we're starting to see that as uh, bearing out in in research then it makes sense that being able to create the support uh the understanding the validation all the messages that we so regularly go through joe is absolutely fundamental at the beginning because yeah. there is a risk at the start, and what I often miss is I see people so far down their journey, but there's a risk at the start of developing some kind of persistence and the unknown, the scariness, etc. that goes with that starting point might be its own feeder. It's like a fuel for the fire in developing that sensitivity that someone can develop. Um, so that's so so I thought I, I would say something about that. The other thing is that's interesting that's coming out is uh, the re a role of well, the nervous system sounds very separate from the rest of the person, doesn't it? And some people have started to and yeah, mobilization of the neuroimmune uh, system. It's so the neuroimmune influences, but the immune systems sort of um, like completely at one with the nervous system. Um, and we've got this amazing, even things like your myelinating cell of the of the peripheral neuron, um, the the Schwann cell, uh, is it, 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 on in one state it helps in terms of the conductivity of the nerve, but in another state it helps for the healing of the nerve. But in the process of it healing, it also um, makes that area more sensitized as well. And mm. there's a greater expression of receptors in that area that mean that you're more sensitive to things like pressure changes and thermal changes and stuff. But what is interesting in the immune world is all the focus was on how when you're going through injury and pain you are, have this elevated profile of pro-inflammatory markers and that's why you're so sensitive but actually what's bearing out now is and then we saw this with the back pain literature is that there is an absence of the resolving factors at the very very beginning um why that might be i mean you can sort of guess yeah. about what's going on in someone's life but why that might be we don't know for sure but is there an ability for us to be able to sort of set up a healing you know what makes the sense you know what gives us a sense of healing if that person sort of isn't expressing that biologically is there yeah. a way that we can sort of move them into that felt space of of feeling like they are healed or not healed but healing and in that yeah. trajectory um, I wonder this, does this bring us on to tapping into the body's own mechanisms, yeah, yeah, the body's own capacity for that, change? That's it. That's that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking um, about how we create that balance in that person. So, um, I mean, at a very simple level, we're saying there's some sort of dysregulation. Um, I'm not sure we've got the evidence to say exactly what will change that yet, but um we could say there are a number of f factors that we 
can immediately take on and, and run with which are choosing the right foods you know reducing things like um, ultra processed foods and, get, and getting some fiber in and maybe even you know getting some natural mm. cultures and what have you so we've got the food stuff and, and also the what you might want to avoid because there are certain things that are maybe more sensitizing for people like um, the smoking alcohol etc um, sleep but sleep can be so disturbed for, for someone who has nerve pain, as I was telling you right at the beginning with my example. Mm. I mean, I remember, I just wish someone had told me, get out of bed, get out of bed, move around, you know, get some blood pumping through your system. That will really help. But I just remember lying awake at night, sort of thinking, how am I going to turn in bed? I, and I remember, God, Joe, I'm telling you this, but I, now I remember, I mean, this arm I could barely move, but I remember sort of locking that around there, locking that around there, and then having this sort of rolling technique in bed to sort of, to, to, just, just to move. And uh, I, I imagine that is probably similar for many people. So some sort of education around sleep, sleep hygiene, what to do if you are waking up could be really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, and we've talked about support and knowledge and understanding and things, but then the other side of things are uh, the role of the nervous system or neuroimmune system in terms of uh, the of movement. And we get a lot of health through movement. We've obviously done um, talks on movement, but specifically in the nerve, what we see now um, uh, is that the that movement is brilliant for increasing uh, perfusion of the nerve the nerve really needs blood if anybody's i don't know if you find this but i wake at night sometimes with a numb arm not surprisingly it's normally the my affected uh, arm that still gets numb more easily so right. and, then when, and then when you get some blood moving in it and feeling comes back it can be quite uncomfortable to begin with can't it but it shows you how important blood flow is to the to the peripheral nerve obviously mm -hmm. you change blood flow here to the nervous system and and that can be catastrophic so um and we can we can do that we can encourage it through movement um but movement doesn't have to be really specific targeted movement of an area it's just this sort of just globally just getting the body moving so mm -hmm. we, we all have some ability to move our or most of us have some ability to move in in whatever capacity that is um you know if the upper limb is affected could they go for a walk um you know if the lower limbs are affected and uh you know can you do something for the upper body um and then, and then the other side of it is about how we sense the world as well so the role of the nervous system in being able to explore and sense the world and and mm. giving that back to them um uh and, th and there are a few theories around um pain relating to to nerve injury and things like uh, amputation so fa phantom limb pains and things about the mismatch of the um of your prediction models your your understanding of the world and what you're expecting to happen versus the data that you're collecting from the way that you act in your world your body you know is gathering data all the time and mm. how that how that's uh, at odds with each other and, and we can obviously do a bunch to start to um to develop a a richer better understanding of what's going on in your body and change things from a perceptual perspective mm. um, that's not separate from moving and touching and what have you but but maybe there's targeted educational process and even there's brain focused um like gmi for instance creating motor imagery would fit this mm. where you're more sort of targeting the perceptual um um shifts and changes um and then there are specific treatment technique targeted towards the function of the, that area of the body and the nerve supply of that body. So things like I've just previously mentioned about things like the, the specific touch technique. So sensory, not necessarily discrimination, um, um, desensitization, but more discriminations where you're really trying to figure out and make sense of 
what touch is, where touch is, what I'm touching, how it feels, how it compares one side and another. And um, I, and I know I'm already running out of time, but but the the comparison and the data comparison is an important thing because that's how we think the brain updates its models, the perceptual understanding of the world. So it's like a compare contrast mm -hmm. comparison. Interestingly, though, with nerve injuries, the changes aren't always uh, aren't always on the ipsilateral it's not diff you know if you've got a neuropathy and it's affecting this hand you are very likely i mean not quite certainly but almost certainly going to exhibit changes even if you're not in pain but of the somatosensory processing of the unaffected side on the contralateral side really? so when someone's doing you know targeted rehabilitation like that it's really worth knowing because because then you've got you need to understand where your baseline levels of comparison for that data are and, wow. and that needs to be you know maybe from an axial point of view or from a very distal point of view so actually you there i mean i'm started to get excited now but then <laughs> knowing that says we have so much mm. there is so much room um to to go and grow and develop and challenge and change um you really that comment right at the beginning that i heard from the the person's um treating physician or consultant or whatever you know yeah. this is what you're left with rubbish yeah bollocks tim bollocks. <laughs> uh sorry yeah um anyway so i started a load of rubbish uh, <laughs> so, so, so so this but 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 you know what that um perceptual and active inference it's called but you know how we're feeding to that from a treatment perspective um we don't know 100 percent, but my best guess is about that compare contrast and the comparison Oh, oh, there's just so much in there. Oh my God, <laughs> this woman keep going. <laughs> so good. Um, I am going to ask this question from Liz because I promised I would. So I'm going to just read it and then let's hear what you have to say in the context of what you've talked about already. So uh, from Liz, who is one of our regulars, she said, has Tim got any thoughts on the following problem of a young woman with constant parathesia in both feet? in the distribution distribution of the med medial and lateral plantar nerves. She has constant tingling and also some numbness after weight bearing along the path of the nerve and under the toes. Previous history of CRPS affecting the feet, but that was several years ago. More recently, foot, foot tingling developed, suddenly first in one foot and then about six months later in the second foot. It was terrible to see the loss of function again and the associated depression too. However, this time there is no pain. Thoughts? Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, there's different ways you could go down that, but tingling is that perception. It's the feeling that she gets. It may or may not. We just talked about blood flow, didn't we? And how that yeah. can exhibit as tingling as, as you start to get blood coming back. And, and it might be that the set point of your capacity to make sense of blood flow and whether there's adequacy of blood flow might have changed so that the body is more responsive to you know small shifts and changes whereas beforehand you could have um, coped with much more so your tolerance might have been more so uh, what would I be doing here is I would be um, perhaps on one level I want to know about the somatosensory um, mm. uh, processing but perhaps it would be doing things where we're um, targeting some movement and um, movement might be on one level you're getting someone used to standing for periods of time there's certainly things with my crps patients can be really difficult actually uh, not just being stood and the weight going through the leg but the literal weight of the limb as well so when you have a the limb dependent the gravitational effect on that seems to be it's a bit like pots uh, postural uh, orthotastic um, tension so um it's like the blood flow into the area has changed in the way that your um how you respond to that has has changed at a physio you know down at a physiological mm. um, level receptor level um might be a might, might be th one thing but 
um, yeah, it can be really disheartening, can't it? Because it feels like, oh God, things are coming back again. Um, but I'd want to know, you know, gain loss of conductivity, what that looks like. And then, you know, very, very, I mean, God, I can't say this is guidance, but but the way my brain is going is, oh, you know, what's the blood flow to the area? What's the sensitivity in the area like to pressure changes or to, to the gravity? So, yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your thoughts on that. That's great. I hopefully um, we should have a disclaimer. Your... You know, this is in no way medical <laughs> advice, but you know, that's what my, that's where my immediate thinking goes. But but there's lots of detail missing, uh, and I appreciate that. On an mm. email, you can't put all the detail. So thanks for the question, Liz, and I hope that's what Tim's thoughts are. So uh, that's what Liz asked for. So there you go. Thank you. Um, so. Just we yeah we've gone over a little bit but um, I think we managed to get loads in there Tim it was absolutely brilliant and the thing that struck me is that there are just so many different elements to uh, helping people with nerve injuries and um, so many of those different elements come out of different uh, the different education that Tim provides through the Noi Group courses that he teaches so some of it was explained pain some of it was mobilization of the neuroimmune system and some of it was from graded motor imagery. So I have dropped links to those courses into the chat. And if you are thinking about doing any of Tim's courses, then we've got an online explain pain starting next week. That's on the 16th. Um, you've got a mobilization of the neuroimmune system that's in Bradford. That's next week as well, I think. This, this and then an, is it this weekend? Yeah. Um, and then you've got a graded motor imagery online course, which starts uh, in June. Uh, so that if you're interested in any of those, the links are there. Also, we'll send you an email out with the link to the recording from today and uh, you, and also links to all those courses. So if you want to get signed up, it's a it's a great time before the summer break to uh, to get yourself on one of those courses. So thank you, Tim, for today. That was a brilliant jam packed my head spinning a bit <laughs> that was really brilliant once again and if you want to watch the recording you can catch up on the uh youtube channel so it'll all come out to you in an email thanks ever so much for joining us live guys and we'll see you next time thank you. cheers <laughs>